you can possibly buy the larger tool rest like this, and they are expensive. This is anvil steel, and this is an even larger one, and it has the nut, the bolt, entrapped in, in, in here. Angle steel rings like a bell, so I take a triangle of wood and secure it in here with this household caulking, and that really deadens it. And here is the bolt coming through the bottom that accepts the shafts. So you only need one set of posts that you screw on. And you can have three or four of these, whatever lengths you might like. These really do need to be drilled and tapped nice and squarely <laughs> so that they line up. We already have the chuck that will take this. We put our center cut and drill it and tap it and it's just right. If you find that it tilts, file off the high spot until it sits square. This is part of my curtain hanger. These are corner brackets that are rather thick. They're part of my balancing system. This is the padding that goes on, or that's the leather padding so that I don't damage a finished piece when I have to balance it. And if you come down to this lathe, you'll see how the balancing system works. Can you see how far off center this is as I rotate it? Oh yeah. That's pretty bad. Now that would bounce all over the place under normal conditions. Because you don't know what it's going to do to start with, it's real nice if you can ease into it. Down here I have a clutch mechanism that allows me to take the tension off of my pulley. And I can ease in and see how it's doing. Nice balance enough I can turn if I need it to. If I'm way down at the end on a nine foot post, I just step on the clutch and I'll turn the lathe off. It's real important when you put your hose clamps on here that you have these facing the right direction. And that you tape them down. So they'll slap you instead of sticking you? Right. And especially when you have this much hanging out there. That's a problem. Right. So we looked at, did we catch the indexing mechanism on the Oliver? Okay. So we've got indexing on there and that's preset. Somebody comes along and says they want 13 on here and you're not going to get 13 out of your headstock. You just lay off your paper and you put it on here. and. Uh, index it. This is bolted to here. This, this slot allows my hand screw to stay where it belongs. Slot at the top? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Can you see the little line right there? Yep. That would be my witness mark or indexing point. I rotate till it's where it belongs and I'm locked. Mm -hmm. I make my cut, unlock it, rotate it, and lock it, and that's it. 
And that's about all there is to that part. Uh, we talked about this earlier. I don't see anything to talk about right now. So let's say that you have this piece you're repairing. Obviously that's quite a heavy mark, but that's the part that you need to recut your flutes. This is the marking gauge that we had discussed last time and made. Now we're where we need to be and our router carriage will come in here and cut right on this mark. Let's say we've taken all this off of here. Actually, we'll take it off. And it's real nice to have one of these riders mm -hmm. to drill. The worst balancing act I had to do was four and a half pounds of weights on one side on a hand turned piece on the Oliver. I had a, a four by eight by 16 solid concrete block I had to use to balance it. There's no hole here. There's no mark. There's no way that it'll be dead on right. But with this center that rotates on the outside, I can hold the seal and drive it right in. With the one way it rotates on the inside and you've got to put a pin in it to lock it. So it's a little bit a little bit odd to use. Or not not easy. This is my rack for my calipers. If they're not in use, they're up here. Give me a second. Step back here. Right. And you've got if you have the space, a few small ones and then your medium ones and your large ones. And then there's a great big one that I very seldom use that's elsewhere. Machinist use these. This is a slip caliper. Take the pressure off, you slip it over it and it gives you your size. You can lock this in. Now these are tight, but then you can rotate this little knob right here and it will finally adjust out here. They're real nice if you just need to get a quick comparison rather than an exact measurement. If you have a very complicated piece and you've got nine calipers up here, it's kind of hard to keep them straight, especially if, say, one of them gets used in three or four places. So mark your caliper so that you know which one it is. No matter where it is on your rack, you know it's still number one and that's the size you need. In some of the books they will tell you to frequently check the setting on your caliper because it vibrates open as you use it. Well, if you put a wing nut on it, and you've secured it where you want it, it doesn't vibrate open, and they're all the same. These two clamps up here are for holding your pattern, or the piece that you want to copy. The piece I want to copy is gone, but so that'll sit in there, and you can look at it as you go. There's your calipers, and you'll put your numbers on here, one, two, three, and four, indicating which caliber gives you that diameter. Lighting, I have a track light up here. Behind the fluorescent. Mm -hmm. If I have 
something in here with sapwood in it. It's like those psychedelic parties where the strobe lights are beating you to death. And at that time I just completely turn off my fluorescent light because it's really rough on your eyes. And uh, you can just add more lights to this as you need it. Uh, usually something that is going to give me a bad reflection is small enough I can get it done in a hurry and these are sufficient lights. This is my curtain system that helps confine my chips to this area. Mm -hmm. This is PVC pipe suspended or hung on a screw that allows another piece of PVC pipe to slide past the screw and on around. Mm -hmm. Just a simple little clip it holds it up there. You can curve this stuff around and cover about any area. Great, thank you. You can slide this around and cover about any area you want. If you do make these, it's a good idea to curve this so that as you're sliding this along, you don't have to be Accurate. perfectly aligned. It will align itself. The other thing with this one versus the shower curtain pipe is that it will slip on in the middle. And if you happen to hang up on something, it comes off. And you can add these as you want. It's also nice for getting some of your electrical wires out of the way to get lighting or fans, whatever you need. It's going to come down very quickly and easily. So. This is my tool rack, which I feel is real important to hit on. Because when I'm turning, I don't need any tool out there that I own, only the ones I need. I can roll it. This is the sequence in which I'll be using those tools. So I know where it's at. My points are away from me. I don't have them sitting up in a bucket like this. Or I don't have them upside down so that I can't tell what I have. And it works real well. My sharpening stones are right here beside them and I can hone it or go over to a grinder and it's just really nice for me. This is the forerunner of some of the tools that are out there today. You have full RPM on your stone. You have an oil stone under here that turns into slower RPM got medium and coarse, or possibly what they call coarse and fine, and then you have a buffing wheel out here. So you could go from rough shaping to honing to polished with one tool. I have a small amount of wood. I come through the overhead garage door through here. That will go arm saw, be squared, cut to length, and then stacked up, pummels would be marked. After we mark the pummels, 
we need to drill our ends. This is a horizontal boring setup. You drop it in, you push it forward and it's drilled. Turn it over and that end's drilled. And that's how fast it is. From there, they get stacked onto here. From there, they go to the lathe and get turned. I turn all of my work before I sand it. See, I've got a hundred of these to do. I'll turn all 100 of those and then I'll move all of these things out of the way and then come back and sand them. These will get sanded to 80 grit. These, these will be balusters for outside. If you sand them down really fine, you wind up getting undulations in here because you have hard and soft grain. And then that telegraphs through and they paint it. And you've got that really slick surface and it doesn't take paint as well and the painters aren't real happy. And that's the... And then they go right back out the door when they're finished. All right. If I have a large number of pieces, open this window and the four bys come in the window, go straight to the saw and cut off, marked, and then stacked up on a cart. Use for squaring my hands and cutting stock to length. This is a red star. This is the unit that caused the change of Rockwell's series. They bought these people so that they could have this design. This is very heavy duty and it's a 12 inch unit. I cannot cut through a full 4 inch square bed post with a 12 inch blade on here. So now I have a 14 inch blade and that's the reason for the homemade guard because I, I didn't care for the blade floating around. There's many dust collection systems for your radial arm saw. Almost all of them stop at the fence. They just have some something back there. Can you see this little box with the slot in it behind yeah. here? This houses a PVC unit. And it comes right on down and around and right at the front here. My shop vac goes on there. And as this goes back, it's confined in there. And even without the shop vacuum, it'll blow it right on through the PVC and out the front there. If you have a stop block, you need to have a recess so that chips and things don't build up and cause your pieces to get shorter. And if you can afford to have it off the surface, that's even better because now your chips pass under it. Hand screws are very nice for this because they do give you a good clamping force and it doesn't eat up your stock. And you just start on one end and cut it square and come down to the next. If I'm doing a large order, I might need uh, 40, 50 four by fours. They come straight through that window. They come into here, they get cut to length, and then they get put on this bench. And so that I don't have to mark my pummels at the lathe, I go to my table saw. Really nice to have a good feather board. And it's very nice to mark your plywood scraps so you don't throw them away. Mm -hmm. I can stack all of I can stack a whole pile of spindles to be turned in here. Mark my pommel and everything's square. My fence is square, it's here. And that's about all I can reach with, uh, without special tools anyway. And then they'll go on a cart and then they'll go down to the lathe. All we did down there for the center mark 
was mark it, and put a small notch in there with a pointed tool. On this end, we didn't even put a notch. We just found the center. The lathe is running. Driving itself in. It's like possible to see some smoke if we hit a blow away. There you go. That's pretty much in there. You can hold the rotating center on the tailstock for rotating and drive it in. wood, you just wait a little bit longer to force it together. Soft wood, we could have done it in, you know, four or five times faster than that. When it's centers on each end, then it's real easy to turn it in for end and still be on center. The benefit to you is if you only have a tool rest that's this long, instead of having to move it every time, you simply back off your tailstock and flip your wood and now finish cutting up here. We'll go to this lathe here. This is an Oliver pattern maker, it's made in 1910, and I'm only the second owner operator. Now that half down there is a Fay and Egan made in the 1800s. It's connected underneath of this table extension. This is the Fay and Egan? Yes. Okay. And let me... This will swing 30 inches off the carriage, 24 over the carriage. This is a very, very durable indexing mechanism. When you're indexing, you have to have this secured so that your work doesn't turn. That board face plate that secured a homemade disc brake. You slip this up to it, your pin is just to position it, and your disc brake locks it in, and it's completely solid now. This nut can be backed off, and this can be adjusted up or down. This is critical when you're doing a split turning because your reeds or flutes have to be changed at the joint. So you can't use the indexing 360 degrees. You've got one set at 180, move it, and then do the next 180. And that's why this is so nice. This is just plain old steel banding. And to get all these holes exact and drilled, it's kind of a problem because they walk a lot. If you pre-punch them, that's good, but if you're going to pre-punch them, then just punch them out. I actually turned some long-leaf pine logs a while back. They were about 11 and a half feet long. And this has a mechanism that I can set a router on here. I can offset my tailstock and turn tapers, or I can turn as close to perfect cylinders as you'll get in wood. And it's really nice if you've got a long enough distance to cut down. And I can have it cut the square stock down the round and then finish it by hand on the cone over. Okay. This what's on what's along the wall here, Terry? Storyboards? Storyboards. Uh, these are all patterns for the Balances that we were talking about down there, the four bys. They have letters on them 
the company Carolina Homes, Carolinian Homes, has one of each. They can call me up and they say, we want, uh, we want something like B or E, but we don't want whatever's on lot 410. So I go to my notes and I say, well, 410 is B, so they want E. And uh, that's real nice that way. They don't have to keep track of what they've got. They just have to order it and I'll turn it down. This is a mechanism for marking the pommels on these balusters. They're square on both ends. You can take a long time and mark these things by hand or this drops on here like this and you mark. You cut on your lathe till your pencil mark disappears or real close and that's it. This is a very good example of how things do not convert easily. This was a three and a half inch new that they said they wanted up to six and a half inches. Well this looks nothing at all like the three and a half inch new that they sent to me. But that's what they wanted. So and they were happy. That's all that counts. And just many story sticks. Clamp racks. Right here is a piece of that real nice sandpaper from Klingspor that's the, the PSA. Mm -hmm. So you put your 2 by up there and you put that paper on it. And if you bump your clamps, they don't just fall off. Gotcha. They don't have to be secured. It, it's very easy to take them off, but at the same time they don't fall off because that paper holds them in place. Just simple dowels for some of the other ones. And a really neat clamp. Cam action clamp. Huh. This is so nice and fast. Not on the market anymore. If you're doing multiples, it's nice to have a rack that you can put them on. This is simply a bunch of nails through the plywood. I thought you were going to tell me you were going to sleep on that. Well, this one is easier to sleep on so that I didn't have the nails sticking up to bang into the wood. I have slipped quarter inch vinyl tubing over there. Oh, there you go. So if you happen to miss it, you didn't destroy your part, you just, you know, just caught on the vinyl. So we didn't really talk about this area, it's just wood storage? This is my sandpaper. Ah, okay. So my bags are marked for my grip. And so I've got 60, 80, 100, 120. So I roughly know which end of this to go to to look for it. Sometimes you need straight edges, especially if I'm gluing up uh, staves. I have to make sure that my staves are correct. So I've gotten a real nice piece of uh, furniture that had to be modified for a company. I've gotten that edge very straight and it it comes in handy a lot, used frequently. Rolled sandpaper is in a roll down there. I just peel off, cut off what I need. Clamps, just pretty much storage parts for the old lathe. MDF is real nice for checking it out, see if you like an idea. Mm -hmm. It is really dirty though. Yeah. These file cabinets. I'll let y'all know about them now because I think I have enough. <laughs> the shallow drawers are the ones you want and everybody has gone to computer stuff. So now, you got, I've got ten drawers here. They're all shallow enough that I can see what I have. 
I have my travel points in here, a, a nice level, brown and sharp items, just really you know high quality stuff, mm -hmm. and it's not piled up and beat up. Some drills, and the whole place is full of these things. And 